Dr. Kent Minturn is assistant professor at the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts in Portland, Maine, and part-time lecturer in, at Columbia University. He received his PhD in art history from Columbia University in 2007, and is currently completing a manuscript on Jean Dubuffet and post-war French thought. He is a co-organizer with Klaus Atman of a scholarly symposium to be held in conjunction with the Phillips Collection's upcoming show, Angel, Demons, and Savages, Pollock, Osorio, and Dubuffet, starting this month in Washington, D.C. Using Gaston Chessac's art and writings as his example, Kant will attempt to briefly outline an alternative genealogy of Art Brut that commences not with the publication of Hans Prinzorn's book and the surrealist interest in L'Art des Fous that we can translate as mad art, but rather with popular pro proletarian literature in interwar France. Welcome, Kent. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Valerie. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I'm famous for not being loud enough in my talks, but it sounds like it's okay. Um, Valerie, thank you for inviting me here, and uh, Andrew as well. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. It's, um, I'm very impressed. Uh, you're all up here and you stayed this long. If only my students were as dedicated, so um, I thank you for that. And thank you, Valerie, for adding a little bit of excitement and danger to my otherwise boring academic career. So uh, I think that the tent is going to withstand the, the wind. So uh, let me dive right in. Um, it is true that this talk comes out of my interest in Dubuffet as uh, not only an artist, but also as a writer and a theorist um, and even a conceptualist. Um, it also comes out of an impatience um, that I have with the current state of affairs in the scholarship in this area. And I think that um, Hal Foster's article, Blinded Insights, Modernism's Reception of the Art of the Mentally Ill, um, is one of the best articles we have. And I have to be careful because Hal is a friend of mine, and he also recommended me for this gig, I think. So nevertheless, um, uh, I'll read a quote from his article. Um, he writes that Dubuffet's idealization of the art of the insane is similar to those of Prince Horn and Clay. It too assumes notions of essential expression and direct vision. This idealization is a primitivism. That's Hal Foster writing. Um, in one of the best articles I think we have, but I still think that, that that's not exactly the whole story, that we still need to rethink this area. And so, you know, tonight I hope to be, to try to do that very briefly. Um, I want to consider Art Brut's relationship uh, or as something that emerged from a proletarian public sphere. And that's a quote that I'm, uh, or a term that I'm borrowing from Michael Moon's recent book on Henry Darger, um, which I think is a, a good model for pointing things in a new direction. We might immediately ask ourselves, what is there to be gained by approaching Art Brut from this angle, uh, from an attempt to give it a literary genealogy, uh, from our attempts to maybe foreground les écrits brut that is, art brood writing as, as much as art brood uh, visual productions. Uh, one, I think it can be, it can prevent us from um, over exoticizing art brood or over romanticizing art brood uh, or from simply seeing it as a post war resuscitation of the pre war interest in. Uh, Prince Horn's book and uh, what the French call l'art des fous, the art of the insane. Um, art brood is, is more complicated than that. It's not simply uh, or just a resuscitation. Um, a, liter a literary art, um, I'm sorry, a literary history of art brood can also help us rethink alternative histories 
alternative modernisms and perhaps overlooked artists. Uh, it can prevent um, a kind of ossified hagiography. Uh, it can help us shake up the canon. And finally, I believe that a literary history of Art Brut can help us better understand Art Brut's historical specificity in post-war France. I will focus on Gaston Chaysac, a name uh, who is probably very familiar to you. He is, I would say, with the Facteur de Cheval, uh, perhaps France's most well-known outsider artist. Um, he was a, a cobbler by trade who lived um, in Vendée, which is near the Atlantic coast in France. Um, and I should probably apologize in advance because I think his art is, is quite extraordinary and beautiful, but I'll, I may be over-intellectualizing things. Um, I, I won't give a formal analysis of his art, but really just think more about the context and really think about Gaston Chaysac and his art and his writings and the way that he was used as kind of an X factor uh, in the post-war period in France. Um, he was, to borrow a term from R Roman Jacobson, a kind of shifter that took on meaning within given contacts, uh, contexts. Uh, while the surrealist prehistory of Art Brut is, is very well known, um, and maybe this less so, but Dubuffet was on the fringes of surrealism, uh, and he was known by the surrealists thanks to his friend Georges Lambour, who you see on the, the screen now. Um, Lambour was a... Uh, a surrealist novelist and um, a close friend of André Masson and, and others. Uh, he was eventually exiled or kicked out of surrealism by Breton, but he was a very close friend of Dubuffet's, and um, that's about as close as Dubuffet got to surrealists. He was, he was looking at them, but from the outside. Um, the what I'm calling the proletarian literary genealogy of Art Brut is less well known. And it really begins with Chaysac and Michel Ragon, a name that might also be familiar to you. Uh, Ragon is a, a polymath writer who uh, was part of the proletarian literature movement right after World War II. Uh, he's also written books on the history of architecture in France. He's also written novels. But, um, and then he was a close friend of Henry Polay, who you see on the, the screen as well. Uh, both of these individuals were central to the pro proletarian literature movement, which was about literature produced by factory workers, by non-professionals, uh, by working class individuals. Um, it was founded in 1932, the movement itself. Um, and they saw themselves as being very different than um, the realist literature of, say, Zola. Um, they wanted to express the proletarian's experience from within. Um, and although they didn't have a specific political camp, um, it was an answer to Lenin's call for uh, a specific working class literature in Lenin's What, it, what to Do Now. Um, it was very non-academic, non-elitist, et cetera, open to all kinds of expression. Um, in 1946, Ragon published an article on Chaysac, and the interesting thing is that Chaysac uh, was known to the pre-war avant-garde, uh, especially Otto Freundlich, if you know that name. Um, and Chaysac had exhibits of his works of art in uh, France during the war. However, when Chaysac resurfaced in the post-war period, uh, it was as a writer. And Michel Ragon wrote one of the first articles introducing Chaysac, the writer. Uh, the article appeared in 1946, 
in a uh, journal of proletarian literature called Mentanol. And it was the, the tales of a, of a cobbler, essentially how, is how he was introduced. And the way that um, Ragon um, talked about Chesac, I think, provided a kind of prelude to how Dubuffet would talk, to him talk about him later as an outsider artist, as an artist brute. In Michel Ragon's many articles since this first 1946 article, um, he has made a strong case for connections between the rise of art brute, Gaston Chesac, and proletarian literature. Um, Dubuffet also had a pre-war interest in proletarian literature or writing by working class individuals. So in 1923, the same year that Dubuffet discovered Prince Horn's book, um, which is usually the, seen as the start of his interest in outsider art, um, he also discovered the works of a one Madame Clementine Reproche. Um, this is when Dubuffet was working on top of the Eiffel Tower as a meteorologist. And Madame Reproche came to him with drawings of clouds and he was very uh, enthralled by them, very amazed by them. She also wrote, uh, and so early in 1923, Dubuffet wanted to copy down her letters and publish them. So there was a kind of equal drive of his interest in art brood, visual art and art brood writing. In the 30s, Dubuffet attempted to translate classical French texts into popular vernacular or spoken French um, into, in Dubuffet's words, an, an argo or a slang more or less. And in the late 30s, Dubuffet also started to write a series of biographies of what he called non-illustrious men or non-famous common folk. These, we have a few of these left, uh, his, his biographies that he wrote in the 30s. Um, these very much prefigure the kinds of biographical entries that he uh, wrote about when writing about art brood artists in the post-war period. Also, Dubuffet, in 1939, um, Dubuffet was in the army, and he went AWOL, and he went to Cirey in the south of France, and he befriended or, and stayed with um, Ludwig Massé, who was central to proletarian literature in the south. He was also part of the group, and he was kind of the head of the southern branch. In the post-war period, Dubuffet's uh, interest in proletarian literature and outsider literature, we might call it, continued. Um, it's a little surprising that he didn't continue that interest, that in fact, this interest had to be absorbed by his interest in Art Brut. Um, and I think it was because Dubuffet's ideas about the art brute artists really went through uh, uh, an evolving period. And the first name that he gave to the art brute artists or what he was interested in um, right around 1944 or, 90, or 1945 is the, the common man. So this is, um, uh, you're seeing a, a, a lithograph that Dubuffet did and it was for a book uh, by Pierre Seguer um, about Dubuffet as the common man. So he was kind of positioning himself as a common man and when he talked about artists he liked uh, or people that he admired, it was the common man, it was the man in the street, uh, the bus driver, the fireman. Um, he was really interested in the easygoing expressions and the kind of authenticity of their speech and, and um, their, their ways of life, really. He saw, th saw that as a kind of authenticity. However, as I said before, eventually 
Art Brood had to fully absorb this other tradition that Dubuffet was interested in. And Chasac, by extension, had to be absorbed into Dubuffet's Art Brood project. And I think there's really two reasons for that. Um, one, Dubuffet wanted Art Brut to come out of nowhere, and he wanted to be the sole authority of that. Uh, authority and also author, the, the two words are related. Um, so because proletarian literature had a history, it had to be absorbed by Art Brut. It had to be, um, Art Brut could not just simply be a, connect or, uh, a continuation of that. So that's one reason. Uh, second reason is because I believe that uh, Dubuffet's interest in proletarian literature and outside literature really uh, became detourned or um, diverted into his interest in the post-war period in non-committed literature. And by that I mean literature that was um, antithetical to Jean-Paul Sartre's call for engaged literature. So um, this is something that Dubuffet felt very strongly about and it was something that one of Dubuffet's very close friends, the important linguist Jean Paulin, uh, was also very interested in. Jean Paulin was the editor of the Nouvelle Revue Francaise, very powerful person uh, in the publishing world. Uh, was one of Dubuffet's early supporters, and um, Jean Poulin was part of the, the French resistance. And in the post-war period, there was a purge of writers. Uh, there was an attempt to, uh, to you know, uh, punish writers who had collaborated with German uh, and, and written for German newspapers during the war. Jean Paulin was on the committee who was doing this purging, along with Jean Paul Sartre. Uh, and eventually, Jean Paulin went, did an about face. He turned 180 degrees and said, Actually, the, a writer has a right to error. A, writer has, um, a writer's works and their art, his or her art, is different than. Um, their politics. So people were shocked about this, but really, I think Dubuffet, along with Poulin, wanted literature to be autonomous after World War II, and just as they um, wanted uh, art brut and an art that was free from the market uh, and autonomous uh, without a tradition and so forth, they, they wanted uh, a literature that could be the same thing. They didn't agree with Jean-Paul Sartre idea that lit all literature has to be essentially a journalistic reportage and has to be about recording history in the making. So to that end, Jean Paulin uh, started this new um, journal called Les Cahiers de la Pléiade, and you see the cover there. The cover was painted by Jean Fautrier, if you know that artist. Um, Les Cahiers de la Pléiade was really started in opposition to Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, Les Temps Modernes. Um, Paulin wrote a presentation or an introduction for the first issue and translated it is called, or it, it reads, Three Cheers for Uncommitted Literature. And he writes in that introduction, as will be apparent in Les Cahiers de la Pléiade, This journal deals with issues far more serious than the great social and national conflicts that people have lately tended to bore us with. A few lines later, he reminds his readers that, quote, it can easily happen that children or madmen or totally naive and uneducated people will hit the bullseye with their first shot at writing and arrive straight away at the sort of visionary work that we find so enchanting in this journal. 
Um, very, very similar to Dubuffet's um, ideas about art brute that were developing parallel to this and I would say in conversation with this. Dubuffet had a hand in editing this journal and giving um, Pollon commentary about what text should go into this journal. Um, and at times Dubuffet was calling this our journal. Um, eventually they published Gaston Chesac's writings. They absorbed Gaston Chesac into Les Cahiers de la Pléiade. Um, there's an interesting I uh, image that I found of a, of a line drawing that Chesac did at this time. Um, pretty small and it may be hard to read, but it's, it's not titled, but if you can read the first sentence, it's, it's part image, part text. Um, it says, Lisez les cahiers de la Pléiade. Read the cahiers de la Pléiade. It, it's almost a tongue-in-cheek for me, a, a tongue-in-cheek acknowledgement or uh, kind of self-reflexive acknowledgement that uh, Shasak was aware of what was going on to him at this moment, that um, his art had almost become a, an advertisement to, to read this journal. He knew that his art was less important, it was more about his writings and, and that they were absorbing him into this. Um, Les, Les Cahiers de la Pléiade um, was founded right around the same time that Dubuffet wanted to do his initial um, series of catalogs on Art Brut. And Dubuffet had um, a contract signed with Gaston Gallimard, who was the publisher of Les Cahiers de la Pléiade. Gaston Gallimard pulled funding after the first issue um, of the Art Brut catalogs. This continued, and I think that in many ways, much of what was supposed to go into the, the, the first round of uh, Art Brut catalogs ended up in Les Cahiers de la Pléiade, and Chesac would be one example of this. He was absorbed by this. Um, Dubuffet had been very busy trying to circumscribe uh, Chesac and his art even before this. And so one of Chesac's first uh, shows that he had in Paris in 47, that is after the war, um, Dubuffet volunteered to write um, the introduction to the catalog. And this was when Dubuffet was still traveling in North Africa. So, you know, Dubuffet w went out of his way to be the again, the author or the presenter or the editor of Chesac. Um, Chesac uh, didn't like Dubuffet's introduction. Um, he didn't like really what he was trying to, Dubuffet was trying to turn Chesac into. So we have a letter that Chesac writes to Michel Ragon at this moment. Um, about this introduction, and he says to Ragon, uh, Chesac says to Ragon, uh, that he doesn't like the fact that um, Dubuffet is, uh, in Dubuffet's introduction, he stresses, Dubuffet stresses the fact that Chesac is of Arab descent. And Chesac feels that he's over-exoticizing uh, him. So he writes to Ragon, he says, I don't like the fact that Dubuffet, with all of his talent, is, you, is, is introducing me under the pretext of Arab flutes. Um, and he also says at this moment that, in the same letter, that um, Art Brut, uh, Dubuffet is the head chef and I'm the busboy. Um, so, Shasak knows what's going on here and the, the, the way that he's being repositioned uh, through uh, Dubuffet's Art Brute enterprise. Um, Dubuffet, as you may know, um, d does a portrait of Shasak for a series of portraits that he shows in October of 1947. Um, and in 1951, Dubuffet is responsible for editing and typing out uh, Chesac's letters and publishing them through Gallimard. 
And it's very interesting because these are a series of very interesting letters that Chasek writes, and he's really a wonderful writer, and he, he breaks the rules of proper French, and he, he misspells things, and he's really an outsider artist as well as an, or outsider writer as well as an outsider artist. When you open this book, the first letter is to Jean Dubuffet, and you get a sense that Dubuffet is always present there, or it's as much about Dubuffet as it is about Chasek. As I mentioned earlier, Dubuffet's first round of uh, Art Brut catalogs really never saw the light of day. There was one published in 47, and then the rest were not published. Um, in 64, 1964, Dubuffet started this, or wanted to do this again, start over and try to uh, publish the Art Brut publications. And as you probably know, he succeeded. They're still going on today. Dubuffet was responsible for publishing or overseeing the publication and writing most of the entries for the first nine volumes before he turned over uh, publication to Michel Thévaud, the, uh, the director of the uh, Collection de la Brute in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, interestingly enough, Chesac is, is ultimately left out of the second round of publications. Um, Chesac, um, they, they wrote letters back and forth to the end of his, uh, of Chesac's life, um, but Chesac in private criticized Dubuffet of plagiarism, and he also said at one point that Dubuffet fleeced me, that Dubuffet made all the money off of our brood and I didn't see any of it. Um, Dubuffet ended up moving Chesac's work uh, from the main part of the Art Brut collection to the annex. Um, because, he explained, Chesac had too many connections with cultural and intellectual circles in Paris, which, uh, ironically, Dubuffet helped um, Chesac achieve through his publication of uh, Ipoesque au Bocage. In these, this second round of publications, which started in 64, Dubuffet made a series of changes. Uh, and Art Brut, I think, went, moved to a more conceptual or theoretical plane. And he began to speak about the artists as authors. Um, looking through these, the first nine volumes of the, the catalogs, or fascicules of Art Brut, we see an emphasis on artists who are also writers, artists whose visual art, I'm sorry, included opaque graphic elements or pseudographisms, as Dubuffet called them, nonsensical messages. Um, in the first issue, Dubuffet in introduces Francis Pollan. Um, Francis Pollan was an outsider artist. He was a pat patissier by trade, a, um, a baker, and at night he made art, and he invented these beautiful alphabets that were unreadable to anyone except for him. Dubuffet uses his entry on Francis Pollan to really um, extend his ideas about writing. Um, he says what Francis Palanc likes, quote, is only the word, the purity of the sign itself, not its meaning. And he also praises Palanc for his obsession with transfer, transformation of words into forms. Then, only then are they able to take on new life and new meaning. Well, Dubuffet's entry on Francis Palanc in the first, sec I should say, the first publication from the second round of our Brut publications really sets the stage for many other entries that Dubuffet writes and many other artists that he chooses to put in there. So, for example, 
a name that will be very familiar to you. Um, du Buffet includes Al Waz and uh, Laurie Pigeon. Um, he says the same things about these individuals, um, or something similar. Um, for his entry on Al Waz, he spends most of his time talking about her writings, not her art. Um, he, he says, uh, he praises her ability at nominalism, that is to make up new names for things. Um, he says that her writing is performative and presentiste. It's always in the present. Um, her, her inscriptions have no relation to other forms of writing. They, they come out of nowhere. They have no history. Um, and for... For Laurie's works, uh, he says that um, the messages are not destined for anyone but herself, and the, the creation of her art and writing is incompatible with uh, criti critics' attempt at um, discernment or interpretation. And finally, in his most developed entry after the one on Francis Pallon, um, which is on a art group artist named, uh, someone he gives a name. It's a guy named the Count Good Savior. This is what Dubuffet writes about this art brute artist. He's not really writing about the art brute artist, he's writing about his opinions about what literature and writing should be. Dubuffet says, writing has two faces, one that has to do with its contents and one properly stated uh, its enunciations, that's, that's on one side, the contents and the enunciations. The other face of writing has to do with the description itself, the graphisms of the, the hand-drawn mark. And he ends this entry by saying, we are greatly mistaken to believe that the virtue of writing is dependent on its contents. In summary, once again, Dubuffet likes all of these artists brutes because they are also writers, and for the same reason. They render writing opaque. They stress the materiality of the signifier over the signified, and they disregard precise meanings and definitions. Uh, here is Dubuffet with Michel Ragon at the collection of art brutes in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, Michel Thébault, no, I'm sorry, I said Ragon, I'm sorry, long day. Uh, Michel Thébault was the uh, carefully chosen um, director, or the person who became the director of the, uh, the collection of art brutes. And interestingly enough, uh, Thébault, in addition to being the director uh, carried on Dubuffet's interest in art brood writing. Um, and Tevo published um, two books on this. One was called The Language of Rupture, and one was simply called Ecri Brut, uh, uh, Brut Writing. Um, interestingly enough, two of Dubuffet's texts appear in those books, but Chasak's do not. It wasn't until the summer of 2005 that academic and museum communities finally admitted that Dubuffet's visual art might have been inspired by Art Brut. Um, the, I'm talking specifically of uh, a very important uh, Dubuffet and Art Brut show that was at the um, Museum Kunstpalast in Dusseldorf. Um, now I think that there's a need to follow Alan Weiss's lead in a book that he wrote called Shattered Forms, Art Brut, Phantasms and Modernity, uh, 1992, and in investigate what influence um, Shaysak's writings have had on Dubuffet's writings. Um, so you're seeing up on the, um, on the screen, all of Dubuffet's writings have been collected and published, and they sit up on the shelf 
in French bookstores with all the literary luminaries that also get their oeuvre complete uh, published. Um, but Dubuffet also did a series of more experimental texts, en jargon, he called them. So in slang, or they were actually books of phonetic poetry. So they're just, they're French, but they're misspelled French. And so here's one called En Voyage, um, on a, going on a voyage. Um, but as you can see, it's very hard to read the way that he writes it out. It's a text that is dedicated to Chezac. So when you open it, it says, in this misspelled French, in honor of Gaston Chezac. Um, so we, I think we need to continue to investigate that. Um, and I, I also just want to leave the, uh, open the possibility that there's a dual legacy of Dubuffet's art brut, um, and one of it is the visual art that we all enjoy and we all think about when we think of the term art brut. But there's a conceptual and literary legacy too, and we have to think a, about how this um, affected the trajectory of, of French thought in the late 1960s and 70s when there was um, the anti-psychiatric movement, the rethinking of madness by figures like Foucault, Deleuze, and Cristeva. And I also think that Dubuffet's interest in this side of Art Brut, that is the, the graphic side uh, of Art Brut, um, participated in what um, Denis Ollier has called the graphic turn in recent French thought. So I end with um, two images by Roland Barthes, who had an interest in what he called contre-écriture, um, outside writing or, or writing that's against writing. And he also uh, referred to this as uh, la graphie pour rien, uh, writing for nothing. So I'm very interested in how, uh, just as uh, Serge Guibault has asked in his very famous book uh, titled How New York Stole the Idea of Modern Art, um, Serge Guibault asks um, how very populist figurative kind of grassroots art in the 30s in America turned into um, abstract art in the post-war period. Uh, we might ask in, the, in a similar way how um, grassroots literature uh, in France in the interwar period was co-opted and eventually turned into uh, what we're seeing here, uh, illegible writing, art that or um, writing that cannot carry meaning, uh, writing that's opaque. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for this uh, extraordinary uh, lecture. Very rich, and um, that brings a lot of uh, questions and, and interest in the development of research on the on this topic, it's interesting. Also, the en voyage, uh, en voyage is like we are leaving. Uh, I'm leaving in for, for a trip. Uh, arrives in 1950 at the end of a circle uh, cycle for Du Buffet, yeah. uh, and you know the collection came to you know, the, the United States uh, right. the following year in, in 1952, right. uh, 51. Yeah, right. So this is like the end of a cycle and yeah, like, uh, like an homage or, or a kind of a signature. I don't uh, know if we can I'm, see that in that I'm way. I'm taking notes because <laughs> th that would have helped my talk. I, um, I need to add that to the end. And um, yes, before I'm, I, I have Thomas here. You have a question for Kent, please. Um, thank you for making this interesting point. I think, uh, that's a line one should really follow, also for the visual arts. Um, we know much too little about um, proletarian art uh, and exhibitions of proletarian art in Europe before the Second World War. 
Uh, I know, for example, that in Germany that was quite a popular topic and uh, nobody has really written about it. Um, for me, um, of course, I, I see it a bit more complicated and complex because Dubuffet, of course, started looking for artworks in asylums and uh, wanted to obviously also in, in a certain way follow Prinzhorn. Uh, but it explains what you say, explains why he was so disappointed when he visited the Prinzhorn collection in 1950. Um, there, are, there is a document which uh, shows us which works he saw and that most of them he found mediocre or pas intéressant. <laughs> Uh, because his view of what he called Abrut was definitely uh, different from what he uh, said uh, he experienced when he read or saw or flicked through Prinzhorn's book in 1922 or 23. Um, I think it also explains why Abrut uh, could become uh, so popular, especially in America, where there is this tradition of folk art and naive art, uh, which has some parallels to uh, Dubuffet's idea of Abrut, but um, it's not outsider art what Dubuffet praises, and I think that it would be really necessary to make a difference. Mm. Uh, you always talked about outsider art, it's not outsider art, and if you look at uh, the first book which, of this title, Roger Cardinal's book, um, it's clear that he means something else than uh, Dubuffet because he includes uh, several schizophrenic masters of Prince Horn's book and he uh, wants to somehow encompass both. He wants to put together the Abrut line and the Prince Horn line and I think what we call nowadays outsider art is this merge of the two things and I I, as an art historian, would always uh, vote for um, keeping the term abrut to what uh, Dubuffet called abrut. So uh, I think it would, would, be, would be a good thing to differentiate here and also to uh, follow up what, uh, what um, made the development into outsider art from 1972. So I found it very enlightening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I have to ask you a question. When did Dubuffet first see um, the Prince Horn collection in person? On three days in December 1950. 50? 1950, 5 <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow, that's fairly late. I, I yeah. never knew the answer to that question. I mean, I know he knew the, the book very well, but in person it was in 1950. 1950 is a very important yes. date for all this. Um, sorry, I was supposed to answer your questions, not a uh, maybe ask you, but thank you so much. And I, I did not mean to um, keep Prinzhorn out of this um, discussion. It's, it's absolutely central to Dubuffet. And uh, I think it was part of his um, egomania that he wanted to, to pretend that Art Brute could be disconnected from Prince Horm, that he was doing something completely new or that he was, uh, that he discovered Art Brut, that there was no history before that of it. But um, I think the Prince Horn book was absolutely essential to Dubuffet. It, it really uh, started hi him on this track that ended up being Art Brut. Y your second comment about my conflation of the two terms for this talk, that, that definitely needs to be worked on because I know I was doing that and I shouldn't have. It's interesting when you said that that explains why our brute took off in America, I think is, is really fascinating um, because there was that early uh, article in, I don't know, Art America and it was, it was called, uh, it was about outsider art and it was called grassroots art. Grassroots art is almost the American version of proletarian art. Um, and I think there, it, that, that aspect makes sense of, of, of seeing um, art brewed as a kind of grassroots art. It's almost 
skipping over Dubuffet and going back to that the 1930s period that I was talking about. Um, but yeah, the, the terminology. The thing with the outsider art that Dubuffet, I think, gave Roger Cardinal the, the okay on that. I mean, I, I think Roger Cardinal felt like he had to go to Dubuffet and say, is this a, an appropriate translation of Art Brut? And Dubuffet said, okay, which is this passing down of this, you know, authority or authorial authority <laughs> that had to come from Dubuffet. Um, so I think Dubuffet even liked that, but um, but our brood is is really um, different than than what we see maybe in this, uh, and it is we can locate it precisely with Dubuffet and his vision and his enterprise and his his literary project. I think you know writing and publishing and and writing these individuals into history in his own way was was part of his aspirations to be a writer as well. But thank you. I have more questions for you. <laughs> Is there another question? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, the American cultural historian, Morris Dickstein, published a work a couple of years ago, Dancing in the Dark, I think is its title. And it was an examination of American culture in the 1930s. Um, one one of the principal topics that he examined was American proletarian literature. Ah. And he ultimately found it to be that it foundered as a successful venture because while the authors and the subject matter was explicitly outside of primarily New York publishing house concerns, there wasn't a successful distribution of the work. Um, hmm. That it what they used the labor movement and the farm collective organizations as a means both to produce it inexpensively and to distribute it among the membership. Um, but that it, it just ran out of out of interest as the 30s progressed and as the, as the uh, war approached. Was, um, my question is about the French proletarian literature movement. How did, how success, I mean you did distinguish that there was a, a northern, and, at least a northern and southern branch. Yeah. Um, was the proletarian literature movement allied closely with the French labor movement with French agrarian movements and took advantage of those means and modes of production and distribution. I don't know enough about it, but uh, you know, there was this one figure named Jean Lanselme, and uh, Dubuffet was going to include a, a review of his publication, which was a proletarian literature publication, mm -hmm. in the Almanac of Art Brut. Um, so after Dubuffet's catalogs didn't go anywhere, he was going to do a big, thick almanac, and he was going to include his review of this publication by Jean Anselm. We have, we have that, and um, he talks about how Anselm, his review is so great because he makes it on his kitchen table, and he staples it himself, and he hands it out in front of the factory doors as workers are leaving, and that's in Paris, I believe. But you, you know, it's um, you see that Dubuffet's over romanticizing these kinds of things. He's not really interested in distribution. He wants to set up a parallel that, that, according to Dubuffet, there can be a literature that is not um, dictated by the market, the the publishing market, and it's done in small quantities and it's handed out uh, through these means of distribution. Likewise, Art Brut is art that resists the market, it, can't, it doesn't go into museums, um, it can't be bought, or, bought and sold the ways that other works of art can. It was made on someone's kitchen table. So there, there's a real parallel with that, but I don't think that Dubuffet knows that much about the movement or the distribution and doesn't really talk about that, and, and I certainly don't. Um, but it's an excellent question, it would be 
Um, I, I don't know how those works were distributed. Um, we should ask Michel Ragon because he's still, yes, yeah, still active. You know, 300 books later, he's still going strong, so. Um, yes. Thank you for your question. I had a very similar thoughts, actually. And so, to follow up on that, there were um, the movements in the United States in the 20s and 30s, literary movements, the leftist proletarian movements, included a lot of people who, in fact, went back and forth to France. Um, uh, well, Jacob Epstein was one who moved yeah. to Europe, and he was very much part of that with Mike Gold, with Kenneth Fearing, who was, yeah. you know, the head of one of the proletariat poetry movements. Joyce Carey was part of it. Stanley Walker, who wrote, I think, in, in newspapers, both in this country and in Europe. And they were part of a larger group that also worked with a lot of the Dada people in Switzerland, mm. who were getting very similar ideas from phenomenology, from Husserl, mm. from a whole international group that was moving because of revolutions, because of wars, because of Jewish persecution. And they were doing similar things with, all, with developing similar ideas about um, uh, pseudographism, pseudographology. Right. Some of which, some of those ideas originated in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, before the Second World War. A lot of the Dada people were doing that kind of work in Yiddish. They were also working with people in Italy doing similar work. Yeah. Some of, many of whom were coming out of the proletarian movements, but they were working in a different area. They were kind of, I mean, they were all becoming frenzied because of the, the growth, the understanding that wars were coming. Uh, in the United States, a lot of these people were kind of siphoned off because they became part of the movement to work in the Spanish Civil War. Right. You know, and then of course there were political movements to suppress all of those people. But, but there is evidence, and there's a lot of literature in Yiddish mm. that hasn't been translated and uh, that is now beginning to be translated. In fact, okay. a lot of the Dada literature was done in Yiddish because yeah. that was their lingua franca uh, mm. for many of the people. That was, you know, Tristan Sara spoke Yiddish yeah. to everybody. But, so they, they were, that was part of it. There were so many languages that people were interested in doing away with the meaning yeah. of language as well, and also the frenzy of pre-war work. But this, your, your talk is wonderful. There's so much there to unpack, yeah. and there are so many areas that there is a lot of evidence that you know, more was going on. But my question actually was, <laughs> how much did Dubuffet really know about that? You know, even people like Paul Clay who oh, were yeah. working with Walter Benjamin and Adorno oh, yeah. and, you know, and so many others. And they also had bits and pieces of yeah. interest in everything you were talking about. Gershom Scholem, Schoenberg, yeah. they were all involved. Well, the, the historical avant-garde um, play with language, specifically Paul Clay, um, you know, the, the Italian futurists. Um, I was actually going you know, to say the Italian Zaum poetry. Who pension. went back and forth to Moscow, yeah. many of them. And, and, uh, Dubuffet knew that Italy. like the back of his hand. And this is what all, this is everything that Dubuffet wants to hide because he's, he's in some ways just continuing those experiments um, with language. Also, Duchamp, you know, his, the, the puns and the, the performative a aspects of ha having El Asho Oku underneath, you know, Dubuffet was, you know, breastfed on that. I mean, that, that's his, but he wants to bury all that. And he wants to, uh, in some ways, find a counter history of that that is not part of the, the original avant-garde movements that are well known. So me, I think- his burial of that was so was to develop it as a sui generic movement, which was really untrue. Right. It was. It was. It was Dubuc 
it was Dubuffet's fabrications that, that he had discovered something that had never been there before. And I think he goes to Art Brut, or he goes to someone like Francis Palanque as his source of this, instead of going to, you know, the Italian futurists or, or the... But Bonanetti was very familiar with all of that. Yeah. He, and he was going back and forth to Moscow and to Switzerland, you know, in yeah. that circle, gleaning that material before he became yeah. a fascist. It's, it's absolutely relevant. It's, um, it's part of Dubuffet's history. I mean, Dubuffet was in Paris in, in 1922, just hanging out with the artistic crowd. And I mean, I think he, he admits to um, saying that he was very influenced by the, the Dada manifestos, but that's about as, all, as far as he goes with it. Everything else he created, it, it came from his, from himself or from the, the art brute artists that he um, revered. But that's all a, a fabrication. 